GameMaker offers some functions that allow you to access the objects here in your resource tree. And I've got them set up here in an object called Object Control. In my step event, I've got Object Getters and Object Setters. If we look inside Object Getters, we have a few functions we can go through. The first one is actually not a function, it's a built-in variable called Object Index that returns the index number of the object that the instance has been made from. What it's referring to are the objects here. These are their IDs as they appear in the resource tree. The instances are what appear in the game when it's running. So this would be 0, and this would be 1, counting from 0 and incrementing. If I had more objects, it'd go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So if I run the game, we'll see that object index for this object, object control, will be 0, and the object index coming from object player, object player dot object index, which will be stored here, will be 1. And I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so if we look at these stats, we only want to look at the first and second one. We have the control index, which is 0, as I said, because it's the first one in the resource tree. And the player index, this guy right here, is a 1, because he is second in the resource tree for objects. Uh, to prove what that would look like if I switched them around, now player would be 0 and control would be 1. So if I hop back in, you'll see that their numbers have been swapped because this is referencing, as you can see, 1 and now 0. It is referencing the resource tree itself. Um, any new objects created will be added dynamically into the resource tree. You can create new objects dynamically as the game is running, and that's what, more or less what these functions will be used for uh, rather than ones you've already made inside the IDE. Moving on, we've got object exists. This checks whether or not an object actually exists in your resource tree. Uh, I'm checking to see if the object player exists, and if so, we'll put it in object X, and I'll write it out to the screen. Now, of course, it does exist, because it's right here in my resource tree, so yes, one, true, it exists. Um, that's obvious, as I said, because it's right there in your resource tree. But if you added an object dynamically while the game is running, you may not know if it's been stored in memory. You might not know if you added it or not. So you could check to see if it exists already and then do something by adding it and doing something to it. Or if true, it already exists, you can manipulate it or delete it from memory and add a new one. Moving on from there, we have object get depth. So we have all of these parameters here that have to do with objects in our resource tree, like visible, solid, persistent, physics, the sprite, parent, mask, all these things. And they will come up with these getters. And this one is object get depth. So this is getting the depth of the player. If I open up player, the depth right here is 100. So if I run the game, the stats on the left side should say that the object's depth is 100. And here it is. This just moves on like that, so we can go through most of them quickly. We can get the mask, we can get the name, the parent, the ancestor. Now this checks between two objects if one is a child of another. Returns whether an object is the parent of another. So we want to know, hey, is the player the child of the control, the parent? Uh, this one just checks to see if it has a parent at all, true or false. This one check if these two in question end up that way. Um, we have object get persistent, whether or not it's a persistent object, whether or not it's a solid object, the index of the sprite that's being used for its image, whether or not it's visible, and whether or not it has physics. So let's kind of break that down. We'll look through each one. We've got object mask. This returns negative 1. This is not using a mask. Uh, if we open up player object, I'll try to keep both open at the same time. Uh, but right now we have mask, same as sprite. So it's a minus 1. It's not using some other mask. It's using the one that's built into the sprite right here. It's using this one. I could set it to the sprite of something else, and that might be useful to you. But it came up negative 1 because right here, there isn't one. If I set it to something like uh, itself, uh, it would produce the same result, but we'd actually get a different number when we ran the game. Now we have object mask 0, because counting from 0, the reference number or index number here for the sprite is 0. If I set it to box, this number would be 1. Uh, we can get the object's name as well, that's object player, that's quite easy to get, it's uh, right here. 
object parent. That's uh, whether or not it actually has the parent option set here, which is negative one. You could set it to something else and it'd be zero and one. It would go through the resources the same as the mask. Uh, we have a few other options we can go through. It's really simple stuff. It doesn't really uh, do anything magical, but it could be relevant to your game in particular. Uh, we have the object ancestor. This is set to zero. This is actually very specific in the way it works. Uh, we'll save that. We have object uh, ancestor. So this one works like this. Uh, whether an object is the parent of another. So the calling object isn't in question. You get to set two other objects. So we set one which is the object that is being checked as the child and then we have the object that's being checked as the parent. Uh, and this will return a boolean. This will be a true or false whether or not they are. Um, in that case I'm checking is the player a child of the object control? And well let's see. Uh, no. There are no parent set here and no parent set here. So that's why it returned like nothing was happening. If we look back in the game while it's running, uh, we've got persistence. This is also set to zero. There's uh, no persistence set to object player. Uh, nope. So that's false, zero. I mean, if we do set it and start again, that'll be true. It'll be a one. It's another, another Boolean return right here. Now it's persistent. Now it's one. Um, same will be true for all of these. These are all just toggles, so they're going to return 0 or 1, true or false. They are Boolean returns. Whether or not it's solid, right now it's not, so it's 0. If it were, it'd be 1. Uh, whether or not it's using another sprite as its sprite or sprite mask, which one do we have here? Um, right here, sorry. If it's using another sprite, um, and it would return whether, um, it would actually return what the sprite index is, according to the sprite resource tree. And then we have the last few, which are quite simply visible, and physics. Whether or not it's visible and whether or not it's using physics. Okay, this was a big setup to being able to change these things dynamically while the game is running, so it's actually more impressive. For that, we have object setters. These are the functions you can use to then change these parameters while the game is running. Much more cool to use, much more important, potentially. Uh, we can set the object's depth while the game is running. So for that, it's object set depth, and you want to reference the index. So I'm just going to say object player. I'm going to reference all of these objects. Uh, and then I'm going to set the depth to its current depth, but I'm going to increase it by uh, 50, and then keep increasing it as I go whenever I use the D key. So right now I've got object depth set to 100. If I hit D, we can see it's now uh, 150. I can move this object or instance of an object around. Um, this box has a very specific depth as well. It's set to the object control uh, depth, which is 200. So it's, it's further away, so it's underneath. So if I ever get this over 200, you'll see that it didn't actually go behind it. Why is that? Well, this is affecting, once again, the objects in the resource tree. This instance has already been created when the room started. So it read the original parameters and then created this particular one. If I created a new instance of object player, it would read these new parameters. So the new one would be set to 250. And I'll show you that in a second when we go through some more of these object setters. The next one is object set mask. So this sets the mask index of the given object. If I press M, I will be setting the object player's mask to the sprite box. So it'll switch from an elliptical mask to a square mask. Um, it's not something I'd be able to show you, um, but I can show you the change uh, over here. It switched to a one because it was uh, zero originally. Uh, but now it is reading a sprite, and it's reading 0, 1. So it's the first sprite, or second, sprite in the resource tree. So I can change the mask as I go, which might be important to collisions in your game. You might have to change that on the fly. We can also set the persistence. When I hit P, I can set it to true. Uh, I don't have it to toggle back and forth between false and true. But we can show you right here, we've got persistence is set to true. Uh, already, actually, I left it on. 
Let's not do that. Let's turn persistence off and start it as false. And if I hit P, we've got there, there we go, zero. And I hit P, it goes to one. So now that any instance created now will be a persistent version of object player. That means this one that was created at room start adopted the zero. So this one will not be persistent. But any new ones created will be. If we go down to the next one, we've got whether or not it's solid. Same thing, if I hit S, I'll make it true, I'll make it solid. Same thing as persistent, I'm just turning the checkbox on as you know it in the IDE. Solid, false. If I hit S, now it's true. Once again, will only work for new ones created after the parameter has been changed. So let's get into some more and interesting things. We've got object set sprite. So this sets the sprite of the given object. Now right now it's it's just sitting on default. Actually it's not. Now it is. Either way it's going to be the uh, same thing. It's going to be whatever I set it to originally. Uh, but we're going to leave it just as that, uh, the sprite. We can actually do that in the draw event as well. We can draw a different sprite uh, instead. Draw self would reference this particular sprite here. So I'm going to leave it as SP player, but if I click my left mouse button, not only will I change the sprite to the sprite box, I will also create a new instance. This is important because now I can finally show you all of the parameter changes that will be adopted by this new instance of object player. Before I go into that, I'm also going to show you the next part, which is setting the visibility of the object. You can toggle this visibility checkbox right here, whether you can see it or not. Uh, for that, I've got pressing the right mouse button, and then I've just got a variable that just gets checked so I can swap it back and forth um, so that it kind of alternates between creating new ones and making them visible or not. Now. Let's put this all together and finally see the majesty of using these object functions. So I've got this instance of object player. These are its parameters that have come up when I created it. So its depth is 100. It will not go behind this black box because that black box has a depth of 200. Even if I increase it to 250, it still does not go behind it because it's not looking at this stuff. This stuff is changing the object. I have to create a new instance first. So let's change a few other things, even though it won't really matter. We can hit S, now it's solid. We don't have anything that checks solid, but it will change it. We can change its persistence, we can change its sprite, and whatever, what have you. So let's see what happens. If I click my left mouse button, I've changed its sprite to the box, and I've created a new instance of it. So you can see sprite is now 1, because it read 0, and then 1. And now they both move, because they're both reading the movement code for that particular object. Uh, this one would go in between. Uh, got all these black boxes everywhere. If I right click, I've now set visibility to zero. And if I right click again, I've created one with visibility true. Now to show you the depth, it's not going to be very good seeing a black box over and over again. So let's just get rid of that portion of the code. So now if I click my left mouse button, I'm just going to create object player with its original sprite in place. So these two are created both at depth 100. Let's increase that to 250 and create a new one. Okay, so these guys are the original depth, and this one is now 250. Let's see if that's true. Oh, there we go. So now, what you can do is create new instances of objects with different parameters. So you may have thought that all these checkboxes were static, and once the game is running, well, that's it. It's solid, or it's persistent, or it's visible. Not true. You can actually change these things while the game is running, which could be very important to you. You could have to make a new instance of an object at a different depth, or you might have to make a new instance of that object and not have it solid anymore, or change its sprite, or do whatever. The power of these particular functions all have to do with the objects in your resource tree and what your game really needs to do with your objects, a very important part of game making. <laughs>